tonight. We yesterday we ended off with before you write grants. Um, Barbara's going to finish up on uh, session one, and then she's going in to session two, which are components of most grants. So with that, let's get our thinking caps on, and Barbara, come take us away again this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Extremely happy to be here, and I've had more than two hours sleep tonight, so I, you know, who knows I might run, just run. But anyway, I want to make sure that you get everything that um, you are supposed to get, and I want to go back to where we stopped off at yesterday, um, and that is this slide. And for you, you'll have to look at your numbers because I may have added something to mine to make sure that I didn't forget. It does look like yours is page two. Page 10. Page 10 says get registered uh, down at the bottom of the page, and that is definitely what you want to do if you want to get some of those larger grants. You want to go, click that website, and it's going to take you out to a website that you need to get to know in order to get the bigger grant. Now, for those of you who are going to be satisfied with just um, the smaller grants, then you can do the foundations and, and the corporations and probably get up to four has one up to five hundred thousand. So you can get those amounts anywhere from five hundred, one hundred, all of the one hundred, five hundred, all the way up to about five hundred thousand, with an average of about a hundred to two hundred fifty thousand for the foundation grants. And you don't have to go through this system that I'm about to show you. But if you intend to get the larger amounts, you have to get registered here on grants.gov. Now, I don't know how big this is and how well you can see this, but grants.gov is the major website that you need to go to. Um, today, I did give you a paper on how to use the flash drive for anybody who does not know how to use PowerPoint. If you do not have PowerPoint, you have an older computer, if you can get on the internet at all, there's something called Google Docs. And Google Docs has Google Slides. And so you can learn how, you can still open it up on Google Slides, whether you have any type of software or applications at all on your computer. So for those of you using the older computers, you will need some computer skills. So there is a site on my website, and my website is certifiedgrantbuilder.com, that teaches you how to use anything you want to know how to use on your phone or your computer. I use it in my classroom to teach desktop publishing and all the computer classes so I know it works. And uh, so go there and I put the information on this paper so that you can go there. There's videos to teach you so you don't have to ask your kids, kids and anybody else to teach you any of this stuff. You can teach yourself all you need is a dollar headset. And you can listen to the tutorials and it'll walk you through how to use anything. Because you need to get good at copying, pasting, cutting. You're going to be doing a lot of that if you want to write grants in half the time and speed up your process. So if you will go and learn to do that, that will help you a lot. Now back to this. Um, if we go to applicants, so you're going to go to grants.gov, go to applicants, and then it is, you're going to register as an organization. And I'm going to click organization, and uh, it gives you five steps to register. Now, you're going to need someone who don't mind being patient. Is it hard? No, it's not hard because the questions they ask you are questions that you have to answer to. How many of you know your EIN number or know what it will be? Okay, so you have to have that EIN number. You have to have... Um, know what type of organization you are. So it's name, address, phone number, the checking account, in the business name. So those are some of the things that you're going to need in order to register, but it's all information you already have. Yes. And where do you all find that information she just asked you about? It's in your document, is it? Everything you need is in that document. So we'll have an opportunity to go over that uh, in the last class to make sure that everybody knows where this information is in your document, all right? Okay. 
And since I am on grants.gov, and we talked about a grant last time, uh, anybody remember the number of that grant? 11.302. So in order to find that grant, that number is called the CFDA number. CFDA is for Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance. That's what the, you don't have to worry about what it stands for. Just remember the CFDA. But do remember, it's a catalog of all federal grant programs. And on any given day, there are thousands of grant programs, trillions of dollars. I think they gave out $7.9 last year. So there are trillions of dollars that are being given out to different people. Um, so you want to have the CFDA number. The CFDA number is a five-digit number. And as I said, they're not really promoting that like they used to. But that number is where you can get the majority of your information. So no matter what numbers they're throwing out on the website, you want to find the CFDA number. Now, only federal grants have those <coughs> CFDA numbers. But if you're going after a federal grant, which is the larger money, you want to know what the CFDA number is for that particular grant. That's where you can find good information. That's where you can find sample grants to where you're not having to start from scratch. That's how we're able to write the grants in half the time. We are finding samples that are already out there that are very similar to our <laughs> program. So research, research, research. I gave the kids a quote the other day, and it was that um, there is a crystal ball. It is research and planning. Because if you research and you plan, you can find what you need. So you're going to do a lot of research and planning. Because um, they always tell me, Miss Wright, you don't have a crystal ball. You can't tell us where, we, where we're going to end up. <laughs> like, if you don't do some of the things I'm asking you to. So that's why I told there is a crystal ball, is research and planning. So you want to make sure that you research and plan. But I want to show you a little bit about this. Um, see if I can make it a little bigger without upsetting it like I did the other day. Okay. Can you see better? Yes. Okay. So on this website, this is cfda.gov, there is keywords. So you can put in keywords, remember research and planning, you can put in keywords, or you can put in an opportunity number. Now that's the number that they're giving you on the website, pretty much. But it's hard to find anything under the opportunity number. It's better to find it under what number? CFDA number. Now these are some secrets that I've learned over time. The CFDA number, would go down in the bottom. So what was that CFDA number that we're going to put in? 11. Okay, so we'll put that in in a minute. But I also want to show you how to use this to your advantage. Because the hardest part of grant writing is finding the right grant. That's the hardest part, finding the right grant. So right now, forecasted grants is clicked. I don't want forecasted grants. I only want grants that are already posted and available. So how, can you see how many grants are posted and available as of today? Mm -hmm. yep. 2,098 grants are posted mm -hmm. and available. Mm -hmm. So we, that's what we're interested in. Now if we go down here to funding instrument types, you've got a bunch of different types. But what type do we want? No. Grants. In most cases, we want grants. However, if you are doing a home, you're doing child care, you're doing any of those, you might want a cooperative agreement because child care centers work off cooperative agreement. They get paid once a month or they get paid after they do the care. So if you're doing programs like that or if you're doing housing, you might end up with the cooperative agreement. If you're going to house veterans, they're going to pay you every month. That would be a cooperative agreement. But the grant, in most cases, is what we want. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here and click grants and then that's going to get rid of some of the grants because if you don't put some parameters and filters on here, this thing is going to give you, I don't know, multiple grants. I don't know how many grants you're going to end up with. So you want to use the filters. And then if you go down to eligibility, right now, if you haven't got, if you've already gotten your document, then you are a 501c3. So you can click that you are a uh, nonprofit with a 501c3. And in, under the Obama administration, they were 
favorable of the ones who did not have the 501c3. Anybody who gets the job done. But in this next administration, I don't think it's going to be quite as favorable for those who don't have it. So thank God you have it because then that opens up more doors for you. Because before, it, there's, a lot of the grants were going to for-profit, to businesses, to some of the others. So now um, that you have it, it will probably give you, believe it or not, a few more opportunities. Okay, so if we scroll down. Those that have the 501c3, there's 905 grants. So that would be what we would click. Um, those that do not have the 501c3, even now it's 868, so it's less. But it used to be 10, and the other one would be 900. So we might be going back to that. Right? Obama was like, we want anybody who can get the job done. But on the, all the other administrations, basically, they just said 501c3. Because I think he knew that a lot of us didn't have a 501c3. So he said anybody who gets the job done could apply for it. Well, I think we're going back to the way it was, which means you're going to be ahead of the game because you actually have done the legwork and you have it. OK, so you want to click those that have the 501c3. But there are grants down here. And there's even 175 unrestricted that anyone could apply for. So that's where it tells you about the grants. And then if you come down here, it gives you the, the categories of business and commerce, community development. So you can click all of those and find the different grants that you would want. And what you want to do is narrow it down. Remember, we started out with 2,089 grants. That takes forever to go through all those grants. So you want to narrow it down to the ones that you are actually looking for. So make sure that you keep that in mind. That's half the battle with, with grants. And then looking at this database, if you look closely, it will give you the due dates. So you don't want to go after anything that's not going to at least give you a month, a month and a half, two months to get yourself together. You want to definitely get yourself together before you um, spend that time on a grant. So this is a really important link. This is just <laughs> one of the links in here. Uh, the other day, the grant links were not working that well, so I skipped this existing organization. Learn more about what you're doing. If you click that, it will give you the information. So that it's substantiated what he's talking about, about all the different types of 501c3s, even though, for the most part, we only learn about one. But there's, uh, there's so many, and you are in uh, a great position. There's tools, tips, and techniques, and uh, under one of these links, I mean, all the links are, are really good. But some of them are, will just blow you away with the information, and I don't have time to click all of them, so I really need you to click. <coughs> so we're going to move on to uh, potential members organizing your grant writing team. You want to make sure that you know who your grant writing team is. And you have a document that I uh, put together for you guys, because I tell you, you guys are making me do things a little bit different. That's your um, partnership and collaborative development form. If you would pull that out her foundation, the partnership and collaborative development form. That form tells you who should be in your collaborative. So if you're going to have a true collaborative, you've got your nonprofit, you've got your for-profit, your church ministry, your school or college, and your government agency. Those are the five organizations that you need to have in your pocket. Why? Because you don't have time to go look for them. Now, many of those are going to be right here in this room. You don't have time to go look for the church to be your partner you don't have, or the ministry. You don't have time to go look for the school. So you don't need to know who that school is when you are ready to write. Because you only get maybe a month, month and a half to write most grants. You don't get a long, long time. So those partnerships have to already be developed. Now, I put two down there for each one. And I would not put myself down there, even if you are a church. I would have one more church, so there's two. If you are a school, I would have one more school. So if you're a high school, I would go to college. I would have one more school there to be able to partner with. Um, government agency. The government agency depends on what you're doing. So if you are doing justice, Department of Justice, that might be one. If you are doing some type of workforce agency, I would encourage everybody to get a workforce agency. Because during the Obama administration, there was three priorities. And I don't think they're going to change a whole lot with Trump, even though he might go about it differently. The priorities was jobs and education. I mean, entrepreneurship. Now, I think what's going to change is the entrepreneurship. I think 
Trump is promoting jobs, not so much entrepreneurship as much as it was in the past. But the jobs are changing. It's no longer the nine to five, it's the contract job, so it's still entrepreneurship. People have to learn how to work Uber and make that work for you. People have to learn how to, my phone was cracked. A lady came to my house Saturday, changed my screen. I called my insurance company and they said, well, when do you want your appointment? I said, as soon as possible. Okay, tomorrow a lady's gonna come out and change the screen. I'm like, what? So to me, it's dangerous for her and her, but that's the way they're doing it. It's like an Uber thing. She gets paid so much for every screen she changes. So the, that's the new kind of job. The old-fashioned job where you're working Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, those are things in the past. So you got to train people to do that. So if you're interested in training for jobs, it's going to be more contractor-type jobs rather than the jobs that we've had in the past 9 to 5. So that was a priority with Obama. Now I think it's more jobs, entrepreneurship. Um, also, the second one is... Um, Schools and education. Anything dealing with schools and education. From preschool all the way up to graduation. And then the last one is anything else and veterans. Anything else that leads to quality education, zero to 199 years old, and jobs and entrepreneurship, or jobs and contracting opportunities, self-employment opportunities. So those, are, I think, are going to continue to be the priorities. I'm going to be looking and making sure and kind of hearing. I'll know about the next class because uh, he says he's going to do all of his stuff on the first day. Trump says he's going to do his on the first day. Okay, so the, um, you want to make sure that you get your potential members and organize your grant writing team. You want to set up your, um, collect well, we've already went through that, so I'm going to skip this one because I want to make sure that we get to all of me. As you are setting up your team, you want to make sure that you have letters of support. You need letters of support. What a letter of support is is just a pat on the back saying, we support you. We're not going to give you anything, but we support you. Right now, there's a collaborative in this room. Um, the Players Donor Organization and Cascade Media Group. There is a, a collaborative in this room with Barbara Wright, the Pledge Donor Organization, and Cascade Media Group. There are, there are collaboratives all over the place. And so you want to have those collaboratives that support what you're doing. You can't do anything by yourself. Nobody's going to give you money to duplicate what is already there. Get rid of the word duplicate out of your vocabulary. If you are going to be a great grant writer, you have to replicate it. No more duplication. Replicate it. You want to replicate great programs that already exist. They want you to research and look for great programs that already exist. No duplication. So you don't want to create another program in your neighborhood that looks just like the program down the street that's successful. If there's uh, more opportunity because there's more kids, there's more families, there's more people to serve, then you have to be able to prove that there's more people to serve. So no duplication, only replication. We're replicating great programs that are successful so you always want to look for other programs. So you want those letters of support, which are pats on the back. You want memorandums of understanding. The memorandum of understanding, um, did I, I think I grouped that one. Letters of support are pats on the back, but memorandum of understanding is what we have, sorry. We have <coughs> partnerships and collaborations. We have memorandum of understanding because there's something in writing. Or we've done a verbal handshake or a verbal agreement or a head nod or something that says, I'll give you this, you give me that, and we'll get this together. So that's the memorandum of understanding. The memorandum of understanding is an exchange of something. Letter of support is just a pat on the back. You need some of both of those. Those are the agreements you're going after with your five partners. Quick tips for locating grants. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with this because I just told you about grants.gov, but there are also grants from foundations, grants by category. Uh, there are state grants. There are grants for Christian organizations. I'm going to click this and some of you are looking for those. And hopefully it will go ahead and open because this was a great list. And it's foundations that favor Christian organizations. Um, so if it will open, hopefully you will be able to see it. It's a little slow to open, but once it opens, it does come up, so I'll try to... You said they favor what? They favor Christian organizations oh. at the bottom. So if you are a school, you would click the school link. If you are a Christian organization, you click, click the bottom link. 
If you just want state funding, click the state funding link. Uh, grants by category, where you have, um, oh, we finally opened it up, where you have um, animal rights, uh, domestic violence, you have what, whatever your topic is, you have the, that list. So over 10,000 Christian and faith friendly foundations mm -hmm. is on this list. And all you got to do is just click it in your flash drive and it'll take you there and put in what you're looking for. These are foundations that favor giving money to those organizations. Okay, so uh, here is what the grants look like. And I think I showed you that the other day. So I'm not going to go through this again, but I'm going to, uh, we're going to go to this form. You have this form. You have that form in your packet of forms today. It's also in your workbook, but I figured you probably wouldn't want to write in it, so I made another copy. So what you want to know for every grant is the name of the grant. You want to know the agency, the CFDA number for any grant that you are looking at, the due date, the eligibility, the match, the number of grants they're giving away, the award ceiling, and the award floor. Do you remember what I said the award ceiling was yesterday? It's high as you go. The highest amount they will give out. Right. And the award floor is the, the lowest, lowest the amount they will give out. Right. But do you remember where I told you to go to find out approximately what they've been given in the past? What is the name of that? CFPA.gov. And I definitely want to make sure that you are familiar with CFDA.gov because CFDA.gov is going to help you tremendously. So I'm going to go to CFDA.gov right quick and find that grant. While that's coming up, I'm going to go back in here and see what else I can do and go back to that in a minute. Every grant has um, specific instructions. That packet that I gave you last week, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the first day, has instructions for that particular grant. Every grant has their own. So you ask me, well, what do we have to do? Every grant is going to tell you exactly what they want. And you have to give them what they want. If you give them anything else, you won't be successful. The way we are still in the running for the $100 million, and I'm to keep talking about it because that's the biggest one I've ever written. The way we are still in the running is we did exactly what they wanted done, and we scaled it to the amount that they wanted. They wanted somebody asking for $100 million, not $900 million or $800 million. So the grants are going to tell you exactly what they want you to do, and you have to follow their instructions to the letter. What gets most people turned down is not reading the instructions, and not following the instructions. So once you read them, you have to follow them. If they give you a little flexibility, that's the only place you take some flexibility. That's why you want to find a good marriage. That's why you want to do all of that planning ahead of time so that you know exactly what you're looking for. So um, the grants tell you even down to how, what the fund can be. And most funds are going to be 11 to 12 font on the title. They tell you that they want one inch margins all the way around. They tell you that they want a double space or single space. They tell you that they want the executive summary to be the page, a page and a half, and no more than that. They tell you exactly what they want, and you have to follow it to the letter. And if you know that's not your calling, get somebody who is very detailed, because you have to be detailed. They're not even really worried if your budget is accurate all the time. Now, MacArthur Foundation was, but most people are not even worried about that, because the budget don't even get very, very many points. Now, in this business, there's a little bit of math that you have to learn. And you can get it on your fingers. So I'm going to put this down because hopefully that website will be up when I finish. This is the math lesson. Everything in grant writing is 100%. So each one of my fingers represents that 10%. So if your budget, a part of your budget is 30%, that's going to be three fingers gone. You only got seven left. So we are going to be working with 100% in everything that we do. So the budgets that you are going to create, if this part of it is 30%, you know you only got 70% left. By the time you finish, it's got to add up to that 100%.
So keep that in mind because one of the documents you got talk about scalable budgets. And I have never taught that in a class before, but I know now after MacArthur Foundation said that 6,000 grants basically was eliminated because they did not scale large enough, we want to know how to scale these grants up and down. That little budget that you have, builder, that you have in your, on your flash drive will allow you to do it without even using your fingers. All you got to do is put your numbers in and it does it for you. But you're going to have to do it multiple times because if you're doing the, um, let's say one section of your budget is going to be $10,000. You use, put the $10,000 in and it'll do that part of the budget. Another part of the budget is going to be $100,000. So you put that $100,000 and then it tells you exactly where everything is supposed to go. It does it for you. So you don't even have to worry about it. But you do need to understand it in case something happens and uh, you're not able to use a flash drive, not able to find it, and you need to do this grant quickly, or you don't want to share it with somebody and you want to know how to do it. You need to be able to do this pretty quickly. So, and I will tell you, they paid me an extra thousand dollars for the budget because they were so amazed at how quickly I was able to do that hundred thousand dollar budget and get it right. It's a great skill to have and a great tool to have. I really didn't do it. The tool that I developed did. So you're going to have, I'm going to go ahead and put the tool in there. So grant reviewer scoring. The grants are scored by what? Percentage. And what is the total percentage? 100%. The grants are scored also by 100%. So you've got to use those fingers. There will be 50% for that, 10% for this, 20%. And the reason I went to that is because how many percent do you think the budget is? 100%. Usually 10% or nothing. No, that's why I said MacArthur, MacArthur Foundation was really serious about the budget. But in most cases, the federal grants, 10%. So the biggest percent is going to go with, are, does the community really have the need, and do you really have the capacity to do what you said you're going to do? Do you have the building? Do you have the volunteers? Do you already have the people together? Are you all ready together? Are you shovel ready? That's what they're mainly looking for. Um, so I think that's it, and we're going to move into section two, which is doesn't take nearly as long as section one. Section one is so important because section one gives you that background knowledge that most people haven't really, really thought about, and you want to make sure that you're thinking about some of those things because that keeps you from making mistakes later. Grants are simple. I think I was born at four o'clock. Lots of things happen for me around four o'clock. It's something about the number four. And then I heard that one of my ancestors, um, George Washington Carver, used to get up at four o'clock every morning and, and he, would, um, he would hear from God, he said, and he would go out and find different things. Well, all of my programs seem to have something to do with four, and the grants are no different. There are four, I discovered, there are four components to every grant. This is the simple part of it. Four components, just four. The executive summary, which I have nicknamed the five W's. The executive summary of five W's. And what are those five W's? Somebody who knows? Who, what, when, when where, and why. You, and, and how is the how much? We don't do that. That's exactly right. The how much. We do add that in there. You're right. We do add the H later. Okay, and section two is the narrative. That is the story that you tell about your program. And that story has to be substantiated by numbers and statistics and what has happened in the past. You can't be making it up. You can't be talking about what happened on your block. Four people got killed in one week on my block, so I know we need this grant. No, they don't want to hear that. They want to know that you have went out and done some research and, that, and you know exactly what you're talking about based on statistical research. So your narrative is your story. Session, oh my God, session three. The budget and the budget narrative is the cost. It's the cost. The budget is the actual numbers, and the narrative is the story that goes with the numbers. Session four is the supportive, supporting documents and the appendix. Some grants don't even ask for that. 
The bigger grants a lot of times will ask you for a little something, but that's the reason they have you register on that database. Because once you register, you don't have to do that anymore. So most of the time, you've got a 15-page document to put together. Uh, the document for the 100 million was 13 pages. 13 pages. So it's not like it used to be 60 pages, 140 pages, all that. They don't even want all that. 15 pages a lot of times is what they want. So it's not really big. This is only to tell you about what I just told you with the percentages. Which one of these sections do you think is usually the highest percentage? The narrative. The narrative is the highest percentage. Why? Because you have to give them the needs assessments, the problem statements, the program goals and objectives, the implementation logic <laughs> model, met, um, methodology and approach and scope of work. The reason that these are listed here is because in grant writing there is a secret. One of the secrets to grant writing is that every section might be called a different name by a different grant. But you got to remember, it's all the same thing. That's why I say there's only four sections. So some grants, they're going to say they want an implementation plan. Some grants are going to say they want a logic model. Some are going to say they want a methodology. Some are going to say they want an approach. Some are going to say they want a scope. Some are going to say they want a scope of work. It's the same thing. It's the same thing, just different wording. So don't let no grant scare you. When you get through, you will be able to write any federal or state foundation corporate grant. If you take this to heart, seriously. Now, narrative, they can't mess that up too much. Most of them call it the narrative as a header. But under that narrative is where you're going to get all these different names. They really can't mess up goals and objectives. They usually call it focus areas. They can't mess up goals and objectives too much. This one gets messed up sometimes because the needs assessment is sometimes called problem statement, problem, statement of problem, statement of need, need statement, need. But it's the same thing. So don't get nervous. It's the same thing. Um, now under this implementation, this is going to be your kind of evaluation plan. And, and this is going to get broken down. So don't get scared and don't get bogged down in this because it will get broken down even some more. Um, so these are all the things that happen under the narrative. So that's why the narrative is usually worth 50 points. Your executive summary might be worth you know, 15, 20 points. And with uh, your budget, it's not using any points. So actually, this is really where your 100 points come from. It's just different sections of it is worth a different amount. That's usually where your 100 points is. The executive summary may be 15. You know, the budget might be 10. But the biggest of your, your points are going to be right here. Okay. This is the last part of what you need to know about most grants, even though I'm going to break it down some more for you. There are four major goals of all grants. And I have written every type of grant there is. There are four major goals of all grants. Number one is build their collaborative. Number two is work with the collaborative to build the programs and services. Number three is build the coordination and protocol for programs and services. And number four is to implement the program and services. If you do one, two, and three, you have written a planning grant. If you do one through four, you have written an implementation grant. So in building the collaborative, remember how many members do you have in your collaborative? Five. Five members in the collaborative. So the first thing you do is you build that collaborative. What happens after you build your collaborative the first time? What do you think happens after that when you get ready to write the next grant? You use them over again. It's not like starting over. Unless you are doing like I do and I work with multiple organizations. So everybody has to have a different collaborative. Everybody has to have different. Now that gets to be a headache. But if you're working with one group, one organization, this becomes a piece of cake. I can write grants for Hogan in my sleep. In my sleep. Hogan Preparatory Academy was established in 2009. I mean, I don't even need a piece of paper. I can just write them in my head. Because I've been working with them. So it comes easy for me. But once you get that collaborative bill, it will be easy for you because you're going to use that collaborative to come together monthly to build your program. Why do you want them to be a part of it? 
because they're going to help you carry it out. Now you might have eventually 15 partners in your collaborative. The reason I know is because I worked with Housing Authority before, and I worked with Housing Authority to write grants for them to bring in programs and services. Some of you might remember when Housing Authority got booted down to Soho downtown. That was because I was working with them down there at 299 for sale. I went to Trump Plaza that was in uh, New York at the time, Niagara uh, I think it was Niagara Falls, New York, and uh, we went to a se Section 3 grant workshop. When I came back to Housing Authority, I was fired up. I'm like, we got to get this grant for Housing Authority. We got together, that grant was put together, and that's how Wayne Minor, um, Shoto, no, Shoto didn't get renovated, but Wayne Minor, West Bluff, all of those uh, developments. Uh, Theron B. Watkins, because uh, a lady down here named Miss, um, I can't even remember her name now, but she, she died, but she would just have a duck if you said T.B. Watkins. But anyway, all of those places got renovated with that money. And we were able to take over 299 for sale and put all types of one-stop shop organizations in a Riverview, down there in the Riverview area. How were we able to do it? We pulled together collaboratives. We pulled together collaboratives. In fact, we were celebrated nationally because Housing Authority had done so good, and they just recently got the grant again. I didn't have nothing to do with that. They just got the grant again to renovate Shoto which did not get renovated back then. Um, so you will work with your collaborative to build your programs and services. Goal three, build coordination and protocol for your program and services. You're gonna do that with the collaborative. Now the smartest 501c3 or the smartest foundation or charity is the one who knows what they're gonna do when they pull the collaborative together. <coughs> You can't pull the collaborative in and you don't know your mission, you don't know where you're going. So I'm hearing that you all have already uh, gotten those together. But just know that sometimes there, there does need to be some flexibility. But when you call people into the meeting, you need to already have your agendas laid out so that people don't come in and take you in a different direction than what you intended to go. So you're going to work with the collaborative to decide who's going to deliver the program, who's taking whatever out to whoever you want. And you have some say as to what you're doing. You just have to know how what you're going to do is going to benefit the community. Whatever you're doing needs to benefit the community. Are you going to be blessed by it? Yeah, you probably will. But you want to make sure that there's also going to be some other people that's going to be blessed by the things that you are doing. That's what the foundations and grants give uh, are for. Um, so implementation of the program or service. That's the last part. That's when you want to get busy. That's the Nike part. What is Nike slogan? Yes, That's right. So the government has two types of grants. They have planning grants and implementation grants. So if you are doing a planning grant, you are only getting it shovel ready. You're not implementing. You're only getting it shovel ready. So which one of those goals do you have to do? One, two, and three. One, two, and three. Look at this down here. It's probably not uh, real bright down or maybe real visible. But one, two, and three is what you do for a planning grant. If it is an implementation grant, you need to do all four. all four. Just do it. So four is not really doing something new. It's just actually carrying out what you said. They will give you, like I said the last time, a hundred to five hundred thousand to plan. And then the next year they want you to implement. Now that's federal. Most of the foundations want you to do it now. So with the foundations, which type of grant would you pay you used to be getting? Planning or implementation? Implementation. I said the federal only have two types. Almost all grants are only going to be those two types. They're either going to be a planning grant or they're going to be an implementation grant. Some of the planning just means you go around the table and plan. But the implementation means you're going to carry it out. So there's only two types. Remember that. And there's only four goals for every grant. Now, this is where you answer the questions of the grant. Once you got that collaborative together, you guys get together and answer those questions in the grant. And this is what makes this so simplified. Okay. So he asked me, am I going to break this down some more? We're talking about that executive summary. If you answer these questions, you will
will have written your grant. And that's why I gave you a sample to take home for homework. Because I want you to try answering these questions. What is the question? First question. History. What is the history of your organization? How long should your answer be? Two to four sentences. There you go. Okay. You got it? Mm -hmm. Proposed project. What is your proposed pro project or program, and how long should that answer be? Every one of these questions tells you exactly how long the answers are supposed to be. Um, I have had a website that I was waiting on, and I want to open another one. So I was at CFDA. I'm going to go back for a second. And I'm sorry, this is taking a little, long, a little while to get these up, but I want to make sure that I give you a little bit of everything. So I'm going to 11.302 since it's working today. And we're going to look for 11.302. And they're not nice. They make us go to the second or third or fourth page. Uh, there's a lot of grants here, but I think it's just on the second page. If you see it before I do, let me know. Okay, 11.302. So when you want extra information, you click this little, um, what is this called over here? Uh, the time timer or magnifying glass. It looks kind of like a magnifying glass. Search. search. Yeah, search icon. And here it is. So it gives you the objectives, the, um, the uses and restrictions, uh, eligibility requirements, beneficiaries, who is eligible for this, credentials, documentation, uh, application and award process, um, procedures, deadlines. Um, what I'm really looking for is, um, here's the financial information. So. This is how much money is available for this, 116, uh, 30 million, sorry, for 2015. 2016, it was 32 million, and they have not said what is available for this year yet. The average size of this grant is $70,000. And the investments outside of the grant usually range from 40,000 to 200,000 for this particular grant. But you can find all of this information in that section, where you cannot find this in other places. Here is the criteria for the grant. So you will find a lot of information in here, and there's only a few pages to read. But if you go to the real grant, it's a whole lot of pages, and you get the same thing on every grant. OK, and this is the other thing that most of the questions that people ask me are right here. How long is it going to be before I get this money? These awards are announced throughout the year. Now, most grants will tell you every three months or 60 days or whatever. These are announced throughout the year when you get the grant. So this one's not like some of them. There are no appeals. Uh, there might be a renewal if they like what you're doing. Uh, there, are, I think there might be a match on this one. I don't know. There's no deadline for this one, I don't think. But this is where you're going to find a lot of information. Okay, guys, we're going to go back to this because now I've got the website, I think, to where it will pull up. And I can kind of show you, hopefully, what an executive summary looks like. I pulled it up a minute ago, so hopefully I'll go ahead and pull up. So when you click this link, this is what you're going to see how to write an executive summary. Because what I have done is went out and pulled all of the helps that you would need. Because you can only get so much in here, and we're doing eight hours worth of information in a two period. So I know that you're going to need some help. So the help is embedded in the flash drive. If you scroll down, it will give you a sample executive summary. So instead of saying the Sun City Senior Center, what would you be saying? You would be adding your name in here. Was established as a 501c3 organization in? There you go. So that's why I'm saying you need to know how to operate basic computer. And it's all, the training is 100% free. Mm. Just go to my site, 
go to the site if I have an opportunity doing this week, because the last two sessions, I didn't add anything in there. We want to do practicum, just deep down, dirty grant writing. But you need to have this information first and do that little homework if you want to leave here with a basic grant. So do that little bit of homework that I've given you, and then that will help you in putting it together. Um, so this is the type of thing that I'm going to make sure that I get what I need. Now, can we use this verbatim? No, but it gives you the style. So when I ask you for two sentences about your history, that's the sentence I'm looking for. So do not reinvent the wheel. You're not duplicating, but you are replicating, replicating good programs okay, and good writing. And that is built right here in this link. Now, I have crashed and killed a whole bunch of computers. I'm telling you, I have three computers on me today in case something happens to one computer so that I am taken care of. Because I, those links, when you say you're looking for a grant, the hackers are out there with their daggers, man. They're ready for you. Come on, say you're looking for a grant. We're going to kill that computer. And they put viruses out there. But one good thing about, and I'm not kidding. But one good thing about this is the viruses have been eliminated because I took them all. <laughs> um, you won't have to worry about that. You might get advertisers because what I'm discovering is all the things that used to be free, all of the nonprofits that used to give it away, now they're coming up with ways to charge. And if you know how to uh, maneuver through the system, you can still get what you need. But sometimes they have to have advertisers. That's the way they have found to charge, to keep from charging you. So when you see those advertisements come up, you have to just click the red X. I'm not trying to sell anything. So anything you see that's an advertisement, just click out of it unless it's something that you really want. But that's how they pay for it. When I do my broadcast that I've been doing for 20 years on KPRT, I have to, my business is what supports that broadcast. And so you got to have some advertising. I have to talk about my business. That's how I get paid. So they have to advertise. That's how they stay on the air. So just click out of them if you see those advertisements. So now we're into the narrative. Remember, the narrative is the biggest section of the grant. So when you get ready to write the needs assessment, problem statement, problem statement of problem, need, whatever they're going to call it, how long should that be? One page. You are no longer doing the two sentences. Now you're writing a page about the problem and how you're going to solve the problem. Now, do you do that from scratch? No. What are you going to do? You're going to look into the crystal ball. And what is the crystal ball? Research. Google. The internet. And you're going to type in sample child care narratives. Sample nonprofit home narrative. Sample whatever you're looking for for that particular section, you're going to look at samples. And that's going to help you put your page together. Now, can you copy their statistics? No, you cannot. You have to have your own statistics. So I'm going to show you where the statistics come from. But you are going to find samples out there. And sometimes you can find some well-written samples. So you want sample narratives. Sample needs assessment. Sample problem statement, whatever it is that that particular grant is asking for. Mm -hmm. However, on your flash drive, there are already samples. So all you got to do is click it. Everything, you should not have to be going out and finding anything. Pretty much everything you need is on that flash drive. When you get good, you might want an individual section, so you go, but you, you need to know how to do it in case you do have to go out and find something. But everything you need is on there. There are sample grants on there. There's statistic links. Everything that you need is right there on that. So the program goals and objectives, those are going to be one page. Your methodology and implementation, that's going to be about a half page. So this tells you about how long each item should be. And this is going to give you, by the time you end up, you would end up with about 12, 10 to 12, maybe 15 pages at the most. And that's all you should have. Because that's what most grants don't want a lot of verbose talking. They want to know exactly what you're going to do, and they want to feel like you're going to be able to do it. So we are not reinventing any wheels. This is what makes grant writing possible. 
in half the time. Okay, so now we're going to break down that needs assessment. How in the world am I going to create a needs assessment? I've never done anything like that before. Here we go. We're going to click needs and problem statement. Hopefully this is going to open. And it did, yay. Okay, and we're going to put in a zip code. One, three, eight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do two, seven because I know that one. <laughs> and I want to be able to have something to show you, but, all, but you can just do yours. Um, and this is going to come up. But every zip code has secrets in it. So I'm going to teach you how to use it so whatever your zip code is, you can put it in and find what you need to do. You got cousins in Arkansas. This same flash drive will work for Arkansas because not only does this cover Kansas City area, this is everywhere. And there was, with the other administration before Obama, they required multiple cities. So I don't know if we're going back to that or not, but if we go back to that, you have just what you need right here. Okay, so here, 64127. Now I'm going to make this small again because we needed it big for the other one and it's not allowing you to see much up here. Well, not that small. Okay, so this website is going to tell you how many people are in the area, it's going to tell you how much money they make, it's going to tell you how many drive their cars back and forth to work, it's going to tell you how many children are in the household, it's going to tell you what percentage of them are married, what percentage are single, widowed, divorced, it's going to tell you how many blacks, and I'm going to tell you about three years ago, this pot was about 97% African American. What? About three to four years ago. When I started at UMKC, it was 3% African American. So diversity is big time. Now, I believe there will be a lot of diversity programs again with Trump administration. Whether they mean it or not, I believe there will be a lot of diversity type programs. And this right here is major. It was never this way in 64127. I did a business plan for someone. They invited me down to their establishment. And I, you know, I came from Arkansas, Plum Nelly, from out the country, Nelly out the world, way back behind the woods and everything. And I'm still not too used to Kansas City. And I've been here for a long time, so I didn't really do too much. And uh, I came to his establishment. I could not believe it. I, they, all these guys just riding around with bikes and everything, and, and I, I hadn't even seen this. This was my first time seeing this beautiful place. The houses across the street, I, I have not seen this. I was totally amazed at what has happened in this area. I think some of our ministers have a lot to do with what's happening around here. I need to drive around a little bit more. Um, but that's what has happened in our area. They bought up a lot of the properties, and Everybody's in them, so you got all of your property. You got some property in 64127. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, sometimes when that happens, you've got to look harder to find help. Because what happens is they say there's no need. Now in Kansas City, we are on the way up, they say. But there are pockets that are still needing help. So in order to find those pockets, you have to scroll through and find those sections in here. And this thing will allow you to go and find those sections so that you can help the people you are to help. That becomes block grants. So over here, even though in, in, the, in Missouri, our average salary is 55,000, what is it over here? It's still, adjusted gross income is 55,000. It's still 24,000. It was 19, so it went up quite a bit. It was 19, but it's 55,000 now. So that's 50% more than where it is here. So that would be your needs. That would be your needs assessment. And this would be your support. So you're looking for problems that you can solve on this database. And this is city-data.com. It's in your site. All you gotta do is click needs assessment. Wherever you see those little links, just click that. 
But this is going to give you all types of situations. It's also going to tell you about the businesses that are hidden in 264127 that you could go to to try to get some help. It's going to give you these maps that you can make bigger. So if you are looking for a certain area, you would be able to make this map bigger. Um, it's scared me so bad the other night, I don't want to touch too much. But you can spread these maps out and make them a little bit bigger and find the area that you want to target. And then what do you do? Once you take that little training, if you don't know how already, you snip a copy of these maps and put those right in your grant. I'll show you how. So I'm going to go down here because I'm on Windows 10, I think. So you can type in snipping tool. It's called snipping tool. As soon as you start typing it, it will come up. And I can click, I'm clicking snipping tool. And uh, this is something I copied earlier. But now I'm going to go through, and this is not necessarily a map that I want, but if I wanted this map, it would copy it for me. And I would take this map and go put it right into my document. But if I try to copy it any other way, it's going to just give me computer code. So you've got to snip it. We snip everything at school. So they used to do screenshot. If you do screenshot, it gets the whole screen. You don't want the whole screen. You only want what you need. So you need the snipping tool. Now, for those of you that Mac uses more advanced than I am, the Mac does it different. Do you know how the Mac does it? Anybody have, have a Mac? I have a Mac. How does Mac do it? Do you know? Drag it. Just drag it? Mm -hmm. the, just the little picture that you want. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if this one will work. If you drag this one, it, it might turn into code. So if it turns into code, Mac has a snipping tool. You might have to Google it. Mac does have a snipping tool. So Barbara, all that information that was in Zone 27, is that based right. off the, the census? It starts with the census, but they up there, the update there is more often than the census. Theirs is updated monthly, yearly. Like this changed from last year, and the census was done in 2010. So yeah. this one keeps up. The census is already not empirical data. Uh, my master's degree people might know what that means, but the empirical data is data that's older than six years. If you want it to be considered good data, valid data, it can't be older than six years. So the census is already outdated as of this year. So you want to get updated information. This website has updated information. And there are other places that you can go and get some updates. But you want as much as you possibly can get in one place to where you're not having to run all over the place. So city-data has been that place for me. But if I just scroll through, there's so many different things. and. Um, let me see if I can get this to spread out. Um, can't, I can't spread it out here, but you'll be able, if uh, normally I can get this to spread out. So it will normally spread out. I just can't remember right now how to, um, how to get it to go. But any of these graphs that you would need, it tells you about crime, the median house value. Another thing that it tells you about that I think is extremely important, how many people drove along, it gives you the neighborhood associations. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you want to do something in the community, you can't do anything in the community without the neighborhood association sanctioning whatever you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So this gives you all the neighborhood associations. It gives you all the schools. It gives you all the businesses that are in that area. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything that you need is in this one place. That's how I can write a grant in two hours. Because everything I need is right here. Whatever is not here, I'm not going to duplicate. I'm going to replicate. I'm going to go find a great program. You got it. <laughs> I'm going to go find a great program and try to replicate. OK. Um, and there was one thing I was looking for that I wanted to show you. One of the things that you can find in here, here are the businesses. All these businesses are in this area. And they're hidden behind trees. I found some of them. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't know all these businesses were here. But there's a lot of businesses in this area. Like Pepsi, I didn't realize they were right, they're not in 64127, but right there on 63rd Street and a t shirt manufacturer and all kinds of people right over there hidden in the community. And Hogan has not one banner up on the wall. But um, since I have to teach a class, I don't have time to go chase them. But if I was just doing grants for Hogan, I, they, we would have banners just like all the other schools have banners. Because those businesses are in the area, but if nobody go ask for a banner, you're not going to get one. So there are, in your community, 
There's plenty of businesses hidden behind some of those trees and walls, and those businesses are supposed to be helping and supporting organizations like yours. And some of them may want to, but they don't know how to approach you. So what do you have to do? Approach them. Some of them are looking for ways to partner because you're going to give them advertising opportunities. You're going to give them opportunities to be promoted because what you, do, you are doing supports what they want to do. There's one other thing that goes along with that. What goes along with that is commemorative holidays. We wonder why the businesses and the news media won't come out and film us. I was on TV the other night. You might not have seen it. I was on TV with the Martin Luther King program at Pillars of Truth Church. I was singing in their choir. The news was out there. Why? Because it was Martin Luther King Day, and a lot of the programs had gotten canceled for whatever reason. So Channel Fox Word was out there with their cameras. But somebody had probably told them about what was going on. Right. So if you're doing something for breast cancer, when should you be doing your annual event? Everybody should be having an annual event. So if you're doing something with breast cancer, when should it be? Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Whatever you're doing, if you don't tie it to the holidays, or when we're having programs at our church, the media don't come. Because basically, they don't want to go look for a story. But if they know you are doing a story that is tied to that commemorative holiday, then a lot of times they will come out just to support that, just so they don't have to go find a story. They got one with you. And then once they find somebody, I want to a person who used to work for me, her name was Octavia Sauce Hall. Once they discovered her, they used her for everything. And the guy was that name was Washington. I don't, I don't know what happened to him. I don't hear him in Kansas City very much anymore. But they would use him for Alonzo Washington. They would use him for every story. Why? Because he got familiar with them. So you have to befriend the media or they're not coming out. And you have to host your annual event during the correct month or they won't come out. You have to send out press releases or they won't come out. So there are some things that you have to do. Why would you want them to come out? Because that's how you get the donations. People want to be a part of a movement. They want to be a part of people that are going places and doing things. So you have to get yourself in that position. I told a person that in one of my classes, she went out and had news me out right after that because she contacted them and it was something that was coming up and she was able to get them out. And there's a holidays 365 days a year that maybe they haven't even thought about. So that's the other way to get support. Uh, when I was at Housing Authority, I was up at 4 o'clock in the morning on those shows, the early morning shows that they have and whatever else, because some people are not willing to do that. So if you're willing to get up and go to the 4 o'clock in the morning shows that they have, a lot of times they will give you an opportunity. And you'd be surprised who's up and who gives. And those things are recorded, so they'll go back and look at them later. And it gives you more credibility. You've got to get that media attention. So here's some other st supporting statistics. This is kind of the hard way. The last two weeks, I'm going to give you an easier way. But I want you to know it all so that Very good. You, you can go back to the old way if you want to. I've discovered an easier way to do this that still does the same thing, and I've embedded all the links to help you. It's actually on one page. I split up the pages just so that I could break this down and, and give you all of it. But there is an easier way. It's just that if you want to be able to get the money, you have to understand why the easier way works and then put some of these little tidbits into that. Now, so you got your needs, uh, your problem, you got statistics that you got from looking up the problem, then how will your organization solve them? That's how you develop your needs assessment. Okay, and if you click this link up here, it will give you a sample needs assessment as well. Okay, as far as the methodology and implementation plan, these are the sections of that. And remember when I said you want to look up samples? This just kind of tells you how to do that. So here are some of the keywords. Now when you're looking things up, you have to have keywords. So I've given you the keywords here that you can put in to help you find different sections. So if you're looking for to do veterans programs, you would put logic model for veterans program. And that helps you with developing that methodology. So what is the methodology? 
The methodology is how are you going to evaluate your program? What are your methods going to be? What are you going to do first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh? What was my methodology for putting that out on the table? Everything has a method. My father had, who created us, it's what, I, I, let me see. Okay, all of us are a system, let me put it that way. All of us are a system. We have two eyes, two ears, a nose, and a mouth. After a while, it probably got easier to make us. <laughs> After a while, because we are a system. There are seven days in a week. There are seven oceans. Uh, there's, I mean, there's a lot of commonalities. There's a lot of commonalities. So when you start looking at the commonalities, then you begin to understand the importance of systems and numbers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of importance in that. So develop some systems. Mm -hmm. So the system for research is using those keywords. So you want to put in logic model for veterans programming. Logic model for what? Give me some programs. Um, um, what was that? Adult daycare. Logic model for adult daycare. Logic model for? Uh, inner city basketball program. Inner city basketball program. You can pretty much, or urban. Sometimes you have to play around with your words. Sometimes you have to play around with your words. OK, evaluation. Uh, keywords, evaluation, assessment, and outcome. So the, the logic model is what you're going to do first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Your evaluation is how many people are you going to serve? Who's going to determine that? You are. Your assessment is how will I know they were successful? How will I know the people that I serve were successful? What are you going to do? Surveys? Uh, you're going to do surveys, you're going to ask them um, how many times did, if you're doing an after this program, how active were you prior to coming to this program, how active are you now? I mean, whatever you're doing, you have, you have an assessment. And the outcome is how many of those people in the post-assessment, after the program is over, is going to say they were successful. If you are trying to help people get jobs, how many of those people had a job when they came in? How many of them have a better job now? Mm -hmm. And how many of them will say that they like the job that they have or they're successful? Mm -hmm. Who makes the, the logic model? Who makes the, the survey? Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm going to tell you about the survey. You want to create your <coughs> survey to where you are guaranteed success. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. You create the survey, so you are creating a survey to where you're guaranteed success. You don't want to say you're going to serve 1,000 people and you're going to end up serving 100. <coughs> You are beginning with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. Don't go overboard because if you go overboard and not reach success, you're not going to get any more money. Mm -hmm. So you want to be successful. You are the one that's creating it. But now you don't want your program to cost $3,000 and everybody else's program costs 1000 So we're not duplicating any old bad program. We are doing what? Replicating, Replicating good programs. Mm -hmm. So when you go out and look at the good programs, you want to find out what they have done. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're going to do and improve it. Mm -hmm. Not just take their program and do it word for word. You're going to improve their program. You're going to find out where they got problems and you're going to make it better. Mm -hmm. OK, so management plans and personnel plans, the same thing. When you Because these are some of the things that grants might ask for. Now, will all grants ask for all of these? No. But I have put everything in here that I have ever seen on a grant. And I've been doing grants for 20 years, so I don't think it's going to be too much more coming out. Things might have a different name, different connotation, but this is about it. Now, all of them are not going to ask for this. Now, do you put the stuff in there if they're not asking for it? No. You only give them what they are asking for. So, uh, I'm, dissemination of information just means how are you going to get the word out about your success or failure? Remember, they don't want you to duplicate programs, but they want you to do what? Replicate. So since they want you to replicate programs, they don't want you to hide it under a bushel. They want you to put the word out about your successes and failures. Even if you fail and you saw where the problem was that you can fix it the next time, they want you to put that information out there. Why? So when the next foundation goes to do the program, 
they are going to be able to look at what you've done. So I'm not telling you the wrong thing when I say go replicate good programs because that's what the government wants you to do. And guess what? If your program becomes one of those replicatable programs, they're subject to give you funding for other people to come and look at you. That has happened to several organizations, especially those out in New York, uh, Promise Neighborhood and some of those. Um, program sustainability. Program sustainability means how are you going to pay for this program when the money is gone, when the grant money is gone. Mm. And you're just going to keep fundraising. You're going to keep sending out those grants. Mm. Sustainability. You want to sustain your program by asking for more funding, mm -hmm. by doing more programs. But you want a funds developer, not a grant writer. The reason you would want a fund developer is because I haven't seen too many federal programs that will pay for a grant writer. They pay for a funds developer. Now, you might say it's just a play on words. Yeah, it might be. But funds developers, there's a difference. Funds developers write grants and do fundraising. Funds developers tell you about um, planning events around commemorative holidays. They help you with that financial plan so that you know how much funds you need. So that's the difference between a fund, a, a grant writer and a funds developer. A grant writer writes grants. Fundraisers raise funds. But what you want is a combination. That's what you want. Because that's what the federal government will pay for. So if you get to the point where you've gotten your grant and you want to have somebody come back, make sure that you write in for funds developer rather than a grant writer. That's how you keep your program sustained. Okay, so designing that evaluation, how would you do that? Remember those four areas of the grant? You're going to go back and get those. So, goal one is collaborative development. That's how you do your evaluation. Now, this is the hard way to do the old-fashioned way. Next week and the week after, we're going to learn the easy way to do this. The hard way would be to do this, to wrap, uh, to establish a wraparound collaborative that will meet routinely to develop and implement programs. That's basically what you're going to say, it's something along those lines. Now how are you going to evaluate? You remember what I talked about earlier? Pre and post surveys, collaborative uh, reports, sign-in sheets, and some of you can think of some other things. When we do harvesters, we get signatures, all those, those are fundable programs. Those kids that are coming out every Tuesday night practicing for dance or whatever they're doing, those are fundable programs, even in a, in a place like this. I'm not sure what programs you have. Tutoring, that's a fundable program. Specialized Sunday school, fundable program. If you make it specialized and you're teaching personal finance for four weeks. Don't, I said, why does Sunday school feel like it was 100 years ago? I don't people know. <laughs> Dave Ramsey. You know, he, he's a Christian personal finance person. I mean, if you don't want to use the worldly system, use the Christian system. But that's something to be taught. I, I'm working with Pastor Ben Stevens right now. But anyway, that's something to be taught. You have to teach it. So, um, outcome. 90 to 100% of needed community stakeholders participate in monthly meetings. So now that's where you're going to get your good stats. 100% of your stakeholders are going to participate. Now, are they participating by coming to a meeting every week? No. I tell people, if you want me to be a part of your board, I have to do it electronically. I can put on my headset and I will listen to you, but I think I can't show up to all of those meetings. So that's how you meet. I've got a girl in Oklahoma. I did her 501c3. Her meeting, she had board members all over the country. All over the country. And they attend her meetings by phone, through some of this electronics, and it's free. Man, if you haven't been on Google lately, Google Docs, Google Drive, all of that, all that stuff is free, but now you have to watch it. So don't think you're going to get it free forever, because they even have to put advertisers on it, they're doing some things to make it a little bit different. So you take advantage of it while you can. Every Friday on the radio, I'm giving a new free something that you can get out there through the internet or through your phone. Actually, most of it is apps to be able to help you sustain these businesses. Because even though you are a nonprofit business, remember, it's still a business. 
and you have to find inexpensive ways to keep it going. I have not bought a textbook at Hogan in years. How do I teach up-to-date, effective information to where the kids are excelling and I want awards? I use the internet. My textbooks are all on the internet. And guess what? My textbooks are more updated than the ones you order offline. So you want to use the internet to help you sustain your programs and meet all of these objectives. The next one would be build your program and services. What are you going to have? Pre and post surveys, collaborative reports, sign-in sheets. Down here at the bottom on goal number four where you start to implement, that's where it becomes more specialized. Now those of you who know your program already, you probably can think of some other things that you can add. So your template is going to look just like this. You say, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can if you just go to that site that I'm talking about. It will teach you how to do that in just a minute. And actually, I can teach you that in the next couple of sessions. It's very easy. These things, I did today because he told me he thought he wanted to make sure I'm breaking it down. Um, half of those were made after school today. So I guarantee you, you can make whatever forms you need. He has really helped me to improve. When I go down to teach our Kansas Health Foundation in April, I'm going to be tough. Because I added a scalable model to my program today, which is on that table over there. And you're going to be the first ones. You're getting everything hot off the press. But you want to make sure that you add your personal touches to whatever is up here. Bios and resumes. Everybody in your organization that is a key person, not just that, you know, the averages, but those that are key people that's going to be helping to make decisions, they need bios and resumes. Now, <coughs> there are several businesses built right in this flash drive. For those who would want to do the resume business, this is one of them. It's called Resumizer. Totally free. Printable gives you some of the best resumes I've ever seen. That's how I got hired in Johnson County as the uh, grant writing teacher. I sent them a resume that I made right off here on resumizing. It's totally free. Printable. It gives you samples, and you don't duplicate. What do you do? Replicate. Most of the reason that you're not ready to apply for a grant is because it takes people too long to get you their resume and their bio. By the time they get you the information, the grant is gone. Anybody in here can open a hospital. You know that? I got a client in uh, Florida. She's opened a clinic. She has a third grade, no, eighth grade education, I think. She said, I hired five doctors. I fired one today. <laughs> she wanted to open a clinic, so she did it. This is a great site, and it is totally free, and they say it's going to always be free. I pray. The bios that I have in here are not free, but this is what I'm going to tell you. If you will follow the instruction that I give you, it's still free. So whenever it decides to open, it's looking for the internet. I mean, what it does is it gives you a sample. Because I'm going to tell you, the saints and my African American friends, when I ask them for a bio, they give me an obituary. <laughs> 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 it's sad it's not located the internet. I hope that oh, here we go, yeah! Okay. <laughs> so these links will work if you own the internet. I am serious. Now, y'all laughing, but I'm serious. You cannot give me an obituary for a bio. A bio is a, I this person said, I was born to so and so and so and so. But anyway, the bios are short and sweet and they just talk about what you have done. So let's go to the accountant's bio to give you an idea. If you need an accountant, so this is how you can open a hospital, <coughs> like what I was talking about. You have to give a job description for the doctor. Mm -hmm. If you want to open a clinic in your church, your, your business or whatever, um, in the back of your thrift store, mm -hmm. you have to give the job description. So all of you that have these lofty goals, your goals are not too lofty. You have to get the job description. Remember I said if you don't want to do the job, hire somebody to do the job, and you hire them once you get the funds in, so it's not like it's any money lost. Um, here is a sample bio. Blank is a blank, and it even tells you how to do it. 
So this is what you use, and then you tweak that a little bit. So they're not giving you the free one. They're making you order them. But they have them all listed. So you can find a little snippet and then tweak it to be your bio. Or go to Google and look for some others. But I've given these because I found this, I found this to be the best when I'm writing grants and people haven't done what they need to do as far as giving me that resume and bio. That will get it to you pretty quickly for that management plan. Now the dissemination plan, so this is a breakdown of everything that I was telling you you had to have. You can spend more time with it, but just because we are on a time limit, I'm giving you as much as I can. So dissemination of information, how are you going to get the word out about your program successes and failures? Newspapers, websites, conferences, workshops, and events. And for those of you trying to get a good website, <coughs> I have found that it is hard to find a good web developer. Charles Cope, the guy that's paying for my entrepreneur program, he had a real hard time. In fact, our website's been down all year. Hogan's website been down all year. It's hard to find a good web developer. But the best way to find a decent web developer, that's, that's basically why I update my own website and keep my own website up as, as good or bad as it is, I had to build it. Because I got tired of t paying people to build my website and all they did was take my face off and put white faces on. I got tired of them doing that. I'm like, I don't need you to do that. So what I learned, though, after messing up with that, is that the only way you're going to really be able to get someone to do what you want done is find a sample website exactly like you want it and take a copy of that to the web developer. If they can tell you they can build that, then you've got a leg to stand on, because otherwise it's your word against theirs. So you want to find a sample, and that's why if you click this website, I think it's got about 10,000 samples. And now there's lots of programs to where supposedly they say you can build your website yourself, but apparently if that was that easy, if it was that easy, it wouldn't be so hard to find a web developer. <laughs> but anyway, they say that. But conferences and workshops are another way. And you know you can make your program so big now with like Eventbrite and some of those places sell tickets. You know, especially if you got a good graphics designer or a person who can see, you know, nice colors and put things together. That's not me. I can draw a straight line with a ruler. I have no artistic ability, but for people who really have some artistic ability that can put a nice flyer together for you and put it on events, right, and some other places, you have people from all over the world. I'm telling you, I have sometimes 56 countries on my website, 56 countries, and all the countries here in America, and thousands of people hitting up my website every month. So you've got to have that website to disseminate information. Program sustainability. This is where we're going to go to these budgets. Now, I didn't talk about this form before I go to the budgets, but I want you to make sure that you do this for homework. Find some stats on city-data.com that would help support your organization. Now, this is for those of you who want to leave with a draft grant on the last day. Find some samples. I will help you on each day of our session, but you want to try to find some samples yourself. That's what that's for. So several of those is homework. These two budgets are sample budgets, and they're kind of high dollar budgets. So if you don't have the million dollar phase, just take off a one, <laughs> and that'll get take you down to a hundred thousand or ninety thousand or something like that. Take the ones off. But these are sample budgets, and the good thing about these is these budgets are basically set up the way the um, the grants are normally set up. The one on the right is a helpful services budget, and I like it because on the top it talks about government grants, so they're looking to get 800000 from government grants. Have you found the page yet? It's the one with the two budgets on, the, on it. And I'm talking about the one on your left. That one, had, they're looking for 800000 for grants, 140,000 through foundation program grants, 50,000 through foundation grants, general operating grants, individual contributions, 50,000. That's what they're looking for. So this one gives you their expenses and what they're looking for. Now, um, there's also the other side where it lists the same thing but just different categories. So who's going to determine what's on here for you? You. Basically you. But when you see those grants, those grants are going to tell you what categories you can basically have up there. Like if they are going to, you can get it from grants and in-kind donations, those would be the only two you have up there. Yes? Uh, 
So you can actually apply for multiple grants at the same time. I wouldn't have it any other way. Okay. Yeah. Because you're going to get turned down. You are going to get turned down. You are not guaranteed to get the first one. I've had some successes. But that that is not, I tell people I can't, I am not a miracle worker. Yes. What was that website you said before? City something. City-data.com. City-data. C-I-T-Y. Dash that they D A T A. Some people call it data, some call it data. But are these so these spelled are out D A T A. D A T as in Tom A D A T A. Dot com. But Dot these com. first three are are like different grants, government grants, foundation mm -hmm. program right. grants, operating general grants, which they apply for mm -hmm. at the same time making up this budget. Exactly. Your budget is not coming from one place. Your budget is coming from multiple sources. That's why you don't want a grant writer. You want a funds developer. You'd be surprised who wants to give you money because people don't know how to advertise these days. But what you're doing has to be something that will get public attention so that they can get what they want. So on all of your grants, you're telling these people that you are going to put their name in the bag. You're going to put their name, some information about them. So now for those of you in the ministry, uh, you go to the boat, you're going to have to put their name on your offering plate. So you want to be sure that you be careful about who your partners and collaborators are. <laughs> be careful about who your collaborative partners are because you're going to have to promote them. So, you know, this is one that I developed. And I'm calling this my scalable budget. And the reason that it's scalable, this is the last document, this is your last one. The reason that it is scalable is because it's based on percentages. And that's going to be the difference between mine and most budgets. They taught me something through MacArthur Foundation. I was doing this already, but they taught me that I've got to do this with everything as far as budgets are concerned. I've got to make sure. Well, they taught me the word. Let me put it that way. I was doing it, but I didn't know where it came from. Now, I have to give praise to um, the higher power that I believe in. Because last year on this day, I had double seizures, and they put me on permanent medicine because I had had so many, and two in one day transported in an ambulance, out for 20 minutes cold. It affected my memory, so every now and then I'll start telling a story and couldn't get back to the story. But what I found out when I left the hospital was that the answer I was looking for was on the internet, <laughs> on YouTube. I listened to this Indian doctor that said, 97% of diseases can be healed by the way we breathe. So I started breathing. I'm telling you that story because most of what I'm giving you comes from elsewhere. Because my brain is sometimes fried. And I could, at times, I can't remember the students in my class. But when the miracle happens and all this information starts to drop in, like what I was doing already but didn't realize that it was something phenomenal as far as budgets are concerned and that people were not doing it, I decided to put it on paper for you. So this is hot off the press. Um, I have, you have it, but you had it in the form of a little gadget that's on your grant, which I, that's on your flash drive, which I'm going to show you in a minute that can create these grants, these budgets for you in no time flat. But basically, this tells you how to do it on paper. All of your sections have to add up to how much? 100%. 100%. So when you are talking about your income, it adds up to how much? So if you get 94% from grants, or you get 95% from grants, you're getting 5% from in-kind donations, that gives you how much? 100%. It's that simple. If you have to use your fingers, whatever you have to do to get to that 100%, that's how it happens. Okay, you have a question? Uh, a comment. Okay. You, just hit, you hit, just hit expenses, salaries, and benefits. And do you know that uh, when we share the foundations, 
with uh, new individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the most uh, surprising thing for individuals that uh, uh, are being that are looking at foundations for the first time. When I talk to them about you having a salary and benefits. Mm -hmm. That Salary, takes people benefits, by surprise. That, health that, that's care, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. For your family where um, you may not be able to afford the whole family on your job, well, you can put those things in your, in your program. And the great thing about it is you will find that most times when you buy the insurance on your own through your organization, it's much cheaper than you get it on your job. But use this and make sure you remember the percentages. So this first column, is for you to allocate your percentages. That's what they call it, allocating. So you're going to best definitely become a business professional, and you're going to be the everything in the beginning. I love to draw out the organizational chart. In fact, take a piece of paper and draw out your organizational chart. Take a piece of paper. Now, some of you may be further along than this. I'm going to give you your organizational chart. That's OK. You'll be able to follow. Just take out any piece of paper that you can use or the back of one of these pieces of paper. and. I want you to, at the top to draw a circle about the size of a quarter. Your expenses are going to be the same. Your expenses are going to be allocated the same. And um, everything is going to add up to 100% of the indirect and direct cost. So they're going to zero out. So they're going to balance each other. They're going to balance. Now, you want to make up a budget for your per, your dream budget for the organization, which might be three or four million dollars. But then you also want that $10,000 budget to pay for the dance ministry. Or you might want that $10,000 budget to pay for something else. So, or $5,000 budget to pay for something else. So, um, consider that. And they're all figured the same way. There is a certain percentage that is allocated as far as the federal government is concerned. And it changes based on the type of program that you're doing. So you want to look at industry standard. So the, I don't know if it's in your um, document or not, but in case it's not, there's an SIC code and an NAIC code. Those will give you industry standards. And you need to basically know what those industry standards are, how much do they pay, what's the market salaries, all of this. That's how you can get more information about your industry. You want to be looking up best practices to know what's good in your industry so that you're not out here in left field. A person was trying to get me to help them do orphanages in Africa, and I told them they don't do orphanages no more like that. What they want in Africa, they want those kids to stay in their village. So you need to come up with village programs to where those kids are able to stay right within their village rather than just putting them in orphanages. That was popular back in the day. That's not popular now. And even in America, in home care, when you're providing care for foster kids, they don't want you to call it a foster home or a um, whatever, you children's home or whatever. They want you to call it, they want it to be more like a family residence. Right. Everything is changing. So you have to keep up with the vocabulary. They don't even want you to, they don't want you to call uh, children with uh, mental retardation retarded or any of those. They have a different name. I've forgotten who it is now, but they do have this name. Um, mentally challenged, all that kind of uh, Yeah, the, some of those they've gotten rid of, and, and so they come up with different terms. So you have to keep up with best practices. They change quite frequently. Child care changes a whole lot. Okay, so this right here helps you with program sustainability. This is simple, but it works. Fundraisers, January through December. Grant applications, January through December, and you need to put a money amount there. Now, are you going to be writing grants every month? Maybe not for a while, <laughs> but you're going to be doing something towards your grant every month. You're going to be stuck doing something towards the fundraiser every month. Something towards it. It might just be writing some things down and kind of planning, but you need to be doing something towards it every month. At least every quarter, you need to have a grant out. Because if you get turned down, you've got another one coming. Now, what if you get them all? Because Hogan has gotten grant rich, and my coach has said, Mr. Wright, I don't want no more grants. Now, he just sent me another email, another thing, Mr. Wright, I want to apply for this grant. But, you know, he might say, I don't want no more grants, because we got enough. If you get grant rich, you turn them down. So, like, if you get the same grant, you cannot apply for the same grant to do the same program. 
If you do and you get both, you turn the one down. Uh, let me say you can't accept the money from two different people to do the same thing. That's not ethical. You can apply for more than one, but if you end up getting it, you have to turn one down. Okay. You really do. Right. You, you do. do have to turn it out. Or you have to ask them if you can duplicate, uh, replicate the program somewhere else. Okay. If you can replicate your program, or you, you're going to set up two of them in two different zip codes. And if they say yes, you're fine. Okay. Well, since we all in one bucket here, can we pass that on to someone else in this? Whatever you're going to do, you have to do it in advance. Whatever you're going to do, it has to be done in advance, which means that you have to let them know that you could replicate the program four ways with your partnership, or you could replicate it four times with your partnership, or that your future goal is to replicate the program. Or if you're wanting to do it with multiple groups, multiple groups need to apply separate. So Four. I wouldn't want you to end up getting into any trouble. So you want to find out what the grant says. Now some of the grants will say more than one person can apply. And, and and that's you know that's one of the uh, uh, aspects of the pledge donor organization is that we can have multiple uh, foundations that are applying separately. Okay, yeah, that's right. That's right, that would be the better deal than to get the money from two different organizations to try to use it without speaking with them. So you would want to speak with them. Because if you don't speak with them, then you cut yourself off. And you don't want to be like the bee. He goes and gets one good sting and then he dies. Mm -hmm. uh, this bee stung me on the back of my, on my uh, deck. I was like, oh my God, I was so mad at that bee. And when I read that they go and die, I didn't feel so mad at the people. <laughs> <laughs> one good thing and you could die. Anyway. <laughs> so you don't want to get one good grant <laughs> and take another one from somebody and end up not getting any more because the word gets out there. Remember, you got the done number. You know what that is? That's a tracking system. So you don't want to be tracked. Okay, so for those of you who say, that woman's always talking about millions of dollars or whatever. I'm thinking $10,000. i am going to show you how to do a $10,000 budget. Now, this is on the internet. This is BizStats. It's built into your flash drive. I will show you where I got this from a minute ago. I put in $10,000 for a corporation. We're going to say educational services. Let's say you're doing a, a mentoring program or a tutoring program or something. So I click Educational Services, and if this be nice to me, here's Educational Services. I'm going to click it again. You're going to click it all the way through until you get to your budget. Here's your budget. So this is how I used to do it. But the reason I stopped using this one is because this is good for business plans, but it's not really good for the feds because they're not interested in all this stuff. They're not interested in interest or you're not going to have any of that. But look at these allocations. That's what I want you to kind of look at. This is how they did the budget. They would allocate it, but they would allocate it to all different kinds of areas. Well, what I've done is I've streamlined it, and they even give the oh, ratio. Hold on one, one second. One, come down, back down, just a little bit. Down? What? Right. Oh, oh. Uh, up. Yeah, okay, hold, hold. Salary and wages has how much? Salary and wages for this particular uh -huh. um, group is 20%. So. Whether this was 10000 or $10 million, what would your salaries and wages be expected to be? 20%. That's why you want to do scalable budgets. So whether it's $10,000, $100,000, a million, you want to do scalable budgets. Scalable. So you want to use those percentages. Right. Move these around. Until they add up to 100%. Right. If you have anything left after you pay, what do you have left? Profit or surplus? Surplus. 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 Who said profit? I did. The one back there wondering what he gonna do with both of them grants. <laughs> 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 Move away from me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you. You don't have profit. 
nonprofit. You're a nonprofit. You have surplus. 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 And deficit. But we're going to have surplus, not deficit. Okay, so let me show you where I got that from. Right here where it says budget, that's where that is. But because the feds only deal with those, um, with a few of these categories, that's why I developed this. Now, for this one, this is the only one that you cannot use in presentation mode. I am creating an app from this, so this one has to be used in, um, let me see if I can get back to it. This one has to be used in edit mode. Edit mode is when you have these little pictures over on the side. Presentation mode is when you go up here to slideshow, and then uh, once you click slideshow, you say from the beginning or from the current slide. I'm going to click, click from the current slide. So this takes you to uh, presentation. Uh, are were you seeing this? Did you see what I just did? Yeah. Or was it? Okay. So I'm going to click escape and go back to edit mode. Now in edit mode, you can put your cursor in here and you can type the number you want. So I'm going to say, let's say you tried it when you went home after the first meeting. There's your grant. That's $500 grant. That's $500. Mm -hmm. Now, you might not actually be going after a $500 grant, but just one section of your grant, you've allocated $500 to it. So if you need to allocate for that particular budget, then you would do it again. This is the last slide. I'm just going to show you a couple more of these, and then I will answer your questions. So let's say you want $500,000. you are trying to go after the Ford grant. You put in five. Hundred thousand. This is what I call my scalable budgeting system. So this time in personnel, you would have how much? Fringe benefits, thirty thousand. So you don't have to do the budgets anymore. Basically, if you got your flash drive, all you got to do is go in there and put the number in, and it will give it to you. Now, do you want to use all those zeros? Not necessarily. You might want to start with five, two, three, four, six. So you need to kind of know how much money you're going after. Just put that amount in there, and it will allocate the budget to you, for you. That's how I was able to do a million-dollar grant in 45 minutes and get paid a thousand big ones. I did not want to take their money, but oh, I took it. Because <laughs> so they insisted. <laughs> I'm serious. So this thing works. This works. So the percentages are these are default, and they're little less than what the feds allow, so that you stay aligned. Because they allow about uh, most, not necessarily the feds, but most funders will only allow about thirty percent. They don't want but thirty percent to be in administrative fees um, and salaries. So what I do is I like to put a lot of my people down here on contractual agreements. Because they can be tied to direct cost. But salary people, oh, back to your thing. Let me have you draw that right quick. So you draw a, cir a circle about the size of a quarter at the top. Draw a vertical line down from that, just straight down, about uh, two inches at the most. And then you're going to draw a square, about a one inch square. And then Put a line down from the square, just a little short vertical line down from the square, and draw another uh, rectangle or square, whatever rectangle. Now at the top, in the circle, you're going to put you. In the square or rectangle below, you're going to put your project manager. And on the bottom, you're going to put your customers or clients. That's a basic organizational chart. And you've really got to get that management channel down so you know who's going to be under you. That's as simplified as it gets. But you will work on that and personalize it and make it the, the management channel that you intend to actually use. So next time when you come, make sure you have those documents filled out. And we're going to go from here 
to actually put some documents, put a document together, so by that last week you'll have a document. Documents mean that we should... Okay, homework. Remember the questions where you answered the two to four sentences? That's the major one. And this one, where you are um, putting down your partners. And if you want to take a stab at your budget. If you want to take a stab at the budget, the percentage one. The percentage one. You can use the others as an example. Okay.